Welcome to another episode of BT Sport Open Map. I'm Adam Catterall. With me as ever, Nick Pete, and the man whose name is on the tin, the one and only Mr. Dan Hardy. Lots going on in the world of MMA, and this show is concentrating on what's going on in Conor McGregor's world. You will have seen over the last couple of months, he's been quite outspoken with everything that's going on with the world health pandemic, and we commend him for his work that he's been doing over in Ireland, donating 1.3 million euros worth of PPE and delivering it himself. But you will have seen, recently, he's decided to take back to his social media and started shooting shots at everybody in the lightweight and welterweight division. So let's get stuck into it. The runners and riders of who could be next for Conor McGregor. He says July, so bear that in mind when we have this discussion. Nick, I'm coming to you first. Regarding the business of bringing Conor McGregor back without a crowd, did the UFC do it? Yes, of course, we've got to have Conor McGregor back. Come on, he's the biggest name in the sport and the UFC have got to show the world that they're coming back during this pandemic, during this crisis, not half-hearted, full throttle with their biggest pay-per-view stars, the biggest stars they've got available. And absolutely, Conor McGregor is top of the list. So it probably means that he's going to come back on Fight Island. What a way to kick off Fight Island that would be. But listen, Conor McGregor business is good business for the UFC. And if they proved last weekend in Florida that regardless of the gate, they can do huge numbers on pay-per-view. So why wouldn't they bring Conor McGregor back? I guess the million-dollar question, boys, is who do you bring her back against? Well, let's get stuck into that because I've got a list of six here and at the end of this, we'll obviously throw some more names into that because this is Conor McGregor's world. He gets to choose, I suppose. Dan, let's talk about that fight of the weekend because Justin Gaethje put on a fantastic performance against Tony Ferguson and he's now obviously the front runner, most people would say, for Habib Nurmagomedov. But it was uh, he was part of the onslaught from Conor. He was giving him a little bit. He was saying that Habib won't be available, ready to fight in July, but Conor McGregor will. Talk to me about the matchup itself, stylistically, I mean, this gets me salivating, mate. Two lads that are just going to stand up and leather the living daylights out of each other. Well, that's it. But, but you know, two guys that don't like to take shots anymore. I mean, Justin Gaethje at one point in his career, obviously, as, as we've discussed a lot, you know, he was taking shots he didn't need to take. Whereas recently, and we saw that even more in the Tony Ferguson fight, getting his head off the centre line and avoiding shots is far more a priority now. And he would have to do that against McGregor because, I, I mean, I feel like Gaethje is a much better matchup for McGregor than a lot of other people in this division, just purely because McGregor will be able to read his movement patterns and set him up. I mean, although Gaethje has started to move his head, he is still hittable and we have still seen him hurt by, you know, people that can punch. And McGregor's got a, got heavy hands. You know, if, if he lands that left hand on Gaethje, he will hurt him. And, mm. and you know, we, we, we've not seen Gaethje really push the wrestling exchanges. So I don't know whether... I don't know whether he would even invest in that, especially given the fact that Conor did well in the wrestling exchanges against Khabib. I mean, I know, obviously, he got out-wrestled, but, you know, comparable to everybody else that's fought Khabib, I thought Conor did well in those exchanges. That first one was about 45 seconds long, and then in the third round, he defended a couple of takedowns. Like, I think mm -hmm. he would cause Gaethje problems in takedown defense, and I think that... Uh, I think his striking would also cause him problems. It's a good matchup for Conor. I'm, I'm, I think he's relieved at, uh, at the results at the weekend. Mm. Nick, we all want to see Justin versus Habib. But would you have Connor just training, getting himself ready just in case that fight doesn't happen? Because we've seen this on many, many occasions where certain fights don't happen and we need someone to stand in. He is the perfect standing for either of those guys, isn't he? In July? Absolutely, 100%. And, um, you know, Conor McGregor remains, <laughs> as a pusher once again, the biggest name. And if you want to bring eyeballs to the sport during this time and there's not much sport going on, of course you want Conor front and centre. So I'd absolutely have Conor in shape, as you've just mentioned there. Uh, the UFC were alluding to the fact they were trying to make Gaethje versus Habib in July. Um, Dana White has now come out and said it looks more like September. He seems pretty adamant, Dana, that Khabib versus Justin is at the top of his list to happen next. So Conor may have to be the one waiting in the wings, but you are absolutely right. You know, if, if something continues to go on with Habib's father and rules Habib out long term, then absolutely Justin versus Conor is the fight to me. To be honest with you, personally... I'd rather see that than any permutation of the three. Conor versus Justin, for me right now, is the hottest fight in this lightweight division. But again, should something happen to Justin, maybe Justin, maybe Justin can't make that fight, whether it is confirmed for September, then yes, put Conor in after a full fight camp, albeit a behind-closed-doors fight camp, put Conor in with Habib straight away. Let's make that fight happen. They, those three, for me, are the hot permutations in this lightweight division, but 
as we're going to get into, far from the only options out there for Notorious. Well, well, the other option is obviously Habib. Dan, we've seen it before. We've seen Habib do the business against Conor before. How far down the pecking order do you think this fight is compared to the other fights, the other options that are available to Conor? I think, to be honest, any fight that Conor's involved in is is a high priority and and the fans will always engage with it. The fact that the Khabib rematch has got, you know, a good backstory. I mean, it's genuine animosity. You know, there's, there's mm. no... This is no theatre, there's no fabrication here. They, they genuinely don't like each other and fans buy into that. You know, that's that, that's one of the reasons why people love the likes of Connor and Diaz and Masvidal. They, you know, they're very genuine and, you know, people can buy into their, their character. And, you know, that animosity is real, so that will always sell. I, I, th- I think I think it's a less interesting matchup stylistically than than the than the Gaethje fight. But I think hmm. it's interesting because it, it kind of works in a bit of a circle. In my opinion, like, and this is the way MMA is. I mean, styles make fights, and you know these these three are kind of caught in a bit of a triangle because I think Conor's got a good chance of beating Gaethje, but a lower chance of beating Khabib. And I think the same goes for Gaethje. I think he's got a good chance of beating Khabib, but a lower chance of beating McGregor. And then for Khabib, it's the other way around. It's you know I think he's got a good chance of beating McGregor and a lower chance of beating Gaethje. I think stylistically, like on any given night, they could just beat each other constantly. I, mm. I think as far as what sells, I think McGregor against Gaethje, I think, you know, <laughs> I think people realize that that is going to be a, a hell of a fight. No, no matter when it takes place, whether there's a belt on the line, no matter what weight class, really, like this, just the style of those two fighters is, is electrifying. Um, mm. But at the same time, the animosity between M- M- McGregor and Khabib is so genuine that we'd love to see that play out again. And you know, it is unfinished business. I do think McGregor can evolve from one fight to the next. I think we've seen it. And I think that, uh, I think he learned a lot from that first fight against Khabib. Dan, talk to me about the possibility of Conor McGregor fighting Tony Ferguson, obviously coming off a loss, but he was on a 12 fight win streak. Does anybody really want to be fighting Tony Ferguson unless they absolutely have to? I mean, Tony's an interesting fight for Conor because, you know, he, he is hittable. We've seen that. There are holes in his game, which we discussed before the fight happened. I mean, you know, he, he is kind of wild. He does fight very long and he gets away with stuff because of his reach. And I mean, you know, you, you guys are, are big boxing fans. You, you don't normally see people throwing punches with their chin in the air like that and not paying for it at some point. Um, I think Conor would have watched that fight and seen ways to beat Tony Ferguson. The, the unpredictability of Tony always makes him dangerous because no one knows what he's going to do. But then... On the flip side to that, that requires confidence and confidence that a 12 fight win streak will give you, but confidence that a like, you know, beat down and losing your interim title will take away. Um, mm. So I don't know whether that changes the way that Tony fights. And we always, we also can't forget Tony's kind of getting on in years a little bit. You know, I mean, he's, he's, he's towards the end of his career. So like it, it only takes one loss like that to really change a fighter. And he might just not be the same next time we see him in there confidence wise. So I, I think, I mean, Connor will look at look, look at Tony as probably the easiest fight in the bunch, to be honest, but probably the least to gain. Mm. Um, I mean, he's coming off a loss. It was a bad loss. He got beaten up pretty good. If Connor comes in and sparks him, there's not really much to gain. But then again, you know, Cowboy was coming off a loss when he stepped in there against Connor. So it, you know, it might be another option for Connor to get in there and shine and, and dust off the cobwebs because the last one was what forty seconds long. Um, he might want a little bit longer in there before he steps in against someone like Gaethje or Khabib. Nick, just going off what Dan's just said there, is this the best time, do you think, for Connor to fight, Tony? I don't think there's ever a good time to fight Tony Ferguson, to be honest with you, even when he has been, you know, pretty much punched from pillar to post and and stopped in the in the fashion he was by Justin Gaethje. I think he's still he's king of the who knows he need, who needs him club, obviously. As his, uh, as his career suggests, you know, nobody wants to fight Tony Ferguson, whether he's coming off a loss or not. So I think it's a massive risk for, for Connor. I think this is a lose-lose fight either way. You know, you, you look good against Tony Ferguson. Well, guess what? You're still behind Justin Gaethje. You lose against Tony Ferguson. Well, you, you know, you, you feel like you're three or four steps further back now. So I don't see that much point in taking on Tony Ferguson at this point in time. Had the fight with Justin Gaethje been a lot closer, gone to a close decision, three rounds to two, whatever, then absolutely there's an opportunity there to, to make a bit of a statement. But at, 
other than stopping him inside three rounds. And I believe if 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 Tony Ferguson turned up and put his chin in the air like that against Connie, he probably would get stopped inside three rounds. But other than that result, is there a way to make it uh, more emphatic than Justin Gaethje? I don't think so. Certainly, as G- Gaethje was an underdog, and Connor would go into that fight as a big favourite. So for me, this mm. is on the list. The Tony Ferguson one is the one that I think Team Connor will probably stay a million miles away from. There's bigger fights out there. There's better opponents, and there's certainly better opponents that will make Connor look good. Okay then, with that in mind, and I think we're going down the path of obviously wanting to see Habib versus uh, Justin for the full lightweight title. And if Conor makes a decision that he wants to fight at lightweight, then you've got to look at some of the other contenders. And one of those is one of his former foes in Dustin Poirier. Dan, I'll come to you first and foremost. They fought before, Conor did the business the first time around, but Dustin's a far more uh, accomplished and he's definitely grown as a fighter since that first bout. Is this a feasible fight, a nice matchup that you'd like to see? I think it makes perfect sense. I, I think, to be honest, I mean, Poirier to me made more sense to, than Cowboy because that would have put put Connor within striking distance of a title shot Im- immediately, in my opinion. I still think he needs to he needs to, to fight at lightweight against one of the top contenders before he can step in there against Khabib. It, ju- it just doesn't make sense for him to go from a welterweight fight straight down and expect him to to step on the scales at fifty five. I'm mm. of the opinion that if you're going to fight in that weight class for the title, you need to at least step into the octagon and onto the scales once before, um, you know, at that weight class without an interruption. Like going up and down weight classes, especially between lightweight and welterweight, it's 15 pounds. You know, we're talking about stone in weight. It, it, I, I want to see him on the scales at 55, 56 mm-hmm. even, before yeah. I know that he's he's ready for a title shot. Poirier makes perfect mm. sense. They fought before. They fought at 145. I think Poirier looks better at 155. Um, I think obviously the, he's coming. He's got some frustration coming off the Khabib loss, but he needs a good fight to get back in there, and he'd love to get that one back against Conor. The animosity there is very real as well, and and like Nick was saying, you know, there's there's a lot of risk in fighting Tony Ferguson, and not as much to gain in in beating him over the other people. I think there's there's just as much to gain in beating Dustin Poirier, but it's not nearly as risky as Tony Ferguson. Like Poirier's got more. Um, more established movement patterns. You can predict his his tendencies a bit more. Connor's fought him once before, figured him out within a couple of minutes. Um, I, I think it's that's the perfect fight for Connor stepping back down at 155, especially if if none of the you know if Khabib and Justin are going to fight each other. Poirier is the perfect one to get him in striking distance of the uh, the winner of that fight. And on top of that, Nick. His only defeat in his last six is against Habib and he's got a victory, a stoppage victory against Justin Gaethje in there as Dustin Poirier. It does make a lot of sense if Conor wants to fight at 155. Yeah, exactly. Let people draw the direct comparison. You know, Dustin went to the Middle East, challenged Habib, came up short. Well, what better way than Conor to make a bit of a statement to the world and to step in there with, with Dustin Poirier and do exactly the same thing or that is, as he did last time, make an even bigger impression, I think. Dustin Poirier like so many fighters, including Max Holloway. Losing to Conor McGregor made Dustin Poirier. It kind of, he, he, he realised that he'd been at the biggest table in the sport. He was in the goldfish bowl under the biggest spotlight and he came up short, but he went away and he must have thought to himself, and it, he's built his whole career on the fact that, okay, it can't get any bigger than that now. The sport doesn't get any bigger than that. And since then, he's been on a terrific run, obviously became a top contender for, for the title out in the Middle East, as I say. So it kind of defined him as a fighter, it took him to the next level. He would absolutely give his left arm to take on Conor McGregor, whether it's on an island or it's in the apex in Vegas or whatever it may be. Dustin Poirier is in because he realises that he gets the opportunity to get that one back. And I think Conor McGregor can see Dustin Poirier allow people to make that direct comparison, realise that a fight against Dustin Poirier is the one that immediately puts him right behind Justin Gaethje for the shot at the winner of him versus Khabib at the back end of the year or early next year. I think it's the fight that makes absolute sense. And To be honest, it's the fight I really want to see. Mm. Now, the first person that Conor... Uh, fired his shots out on social media was actually in the comment section of Dana White's Instagram it was of course to his old adversary in uh, Diaz Dan I'll come to you if there's a fight that could launch Fight Island is it the trilogy between these two? (laughs) It's certainly near the top of the list yeah I think so you know it's one of those fights that's 
I mean, that trilogy is just, it's, it's always there. It's like a golden ticket in your back pocket. You know, it, it doesn't matter what happens in either guy's career because, I mean, you've got to think when Nate came into that first fight, he was, what, ranked number six at lightweight. He wasn't ranked at welterweight. The fight was at 170. It was kind of a nothing fight. It was a fight to fill a gap on a card because an opponent was missing. Um, but what we got out of it is, you know, two fascinating fights. Um, and, and this genuine, uh, this genuine, you know, needle between these two guys that are individually fascinating characters, and when they come together, um, seem to make ridiculous pay-per-view numbers. The third fight absolutely makes sense. You know, th this this is even something that, you know, you could wait five years and you mm. can put this on a card and people would still want to watch it. They're just those kind of fighters. It's a timeless fight. Um, I, I mean, sooner rather than later, because I want to see them closer to their prime. Um, but then, I mean, you know. These guys could fight every weekend on Fire Island. I'm tuning in. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, if Connor's trying to make that step back down to one five five, as as Dan alluded to a little bit earlier on, would it be would it be sensible maybe to do a catch weight fight, one sixty five, one sixty, something like that? And is Nate Diaz the type of opponent that he could do that with? Uh, listen, I know Dana's not a big fan of catch weight. I, I'm not too bad on him, certainly if it's you know a non title fight, of course. And I think I think. Connor would absolutely potentially be up for it as a kind of a step down, but I, I also want to see him compete at 155. I think Nate would have to be at 170. I don't think there's much chance of Nate Diaz coming back to 155 right now. And I just don't see this fight happening anytime soon. As Dan says, it's always going to be there. It's never going to go away. Why cash your chips in with this one now? You know, Nate Diaz is a, is a send up the bat signal fight. You know, someone pulls out late notice against <laughs> Connor, or, you know, I think Connor wins the title back. You guarantee, you know, Nate Diaz 3 happens in Dublin in a stadium in the middle of the night in front of, you know, 60,000 crazed Irishmen. That's the Nate Diaz fight. That's when you do Diaz 3. You don't do it now when there's a lot of planning and a lot of uh, moving and shifting taking place. So while I expect Connor at some stage in his legacy to fight Nate Diaz a third time, I don't expect it to be any time soon. And I also think... There's a little bit of gloss gone off the potential Nate Diaz fight right now as well because it's fresh in everybody's mind exactly what happened to Nate Diaz last year when Jorge Masvidal beat him up to win the BMF belt. And that, for me, took the shine off it because up until that point, Nate Diaz was everybody's favourite BMF and he's been completely and utterly replaced as the BMF of the UFC right now. So right now, Nate Diaz, Connor, not for me. Further down the line. Okay, then, with that in mind, you've just mentioned another man's name. If Connor can't get the title fired at 155 and he doesn't fancy a dance again with Dustin Poirier, I know that he said in, on his social media that he'll do the 170 clean up after his demolition job at Lightweight. But there is another name. Nick's just mentioned it there, Dan. Jorge Masvidal. He's on an absolute tear at the moment. He is the BMF. You'd think that he's in line for a full title shot himself against Kamara Usman. But when you think about it, is there a bigger fight right now from a business point of view than putting Jorge Masvidal and Conor McGregor in an octagon together to fight for that BMF belt? No, absolutely not. Not unless you're getting Henry Cejudo and, and Marlon Moraes to fight The Rock or something. I just, it just <laughs> that is the fight to make. Could happen. That's the fight to make. I mean, like Masvidal's emerged, emerged out of nowhere. Like we all know who Masvidal is and, and was and has been back in the day. I remember watching those old street fighting videos before I even saw him fight in MMA. Like he, he's, he's slowly and quietly become a cult figure and then all of a sudden he's emerged very quickly recently. Mm. Um, Nate Diaz, obviously, you know, he kind of he kind of became a cult figure in his brother's shadow who was also a cult figure. Conor McGregor has carved his own groove out of this. Like what, what we got from Nate Diaz against Conor McGregor, I can only think it would be better with Masvidal because Masvidal's got that calm confidence. There's no like kind of aggro ego getting in the way that you see with Nate Diaz. Like Nate Diaz gets genuinely upset and offended and that's why McGregor likes to, likes to mess with him so much. Whereas the banter back and forth between two guys that hold their own space so well in Masvidal and, and McGregor, and, I mean, that's... That's 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 a clash of titans, is what that is. That that'd be an absolutely incredible fight, and and I think you know, I mean, Masvidal is absolutely going to take him seriously, but he's also going to look at it as a stop off on the way to the welterweight title as well. Like mm. he he's going to look at that as, the, as similar to the Nate Diaz fight, because he I I was literally like you can you can go back on my Instagram and watch where I was as Masvidal walked out. He literally walked past me as he was walking out to the octagon, like and. 
just the, the calmness on his face. It was like he'd seen the movie before and he knew <laughs> what was going to happen. It's like, oh, I love this scene. You know what I mean? It was like he already knew what was going to happen. He knew that Nate Diaz was his to beat 10 times out of 10. Like there wasn't a day of the week where Nate Diaz beats Masvidal. It just, it just, it wasn't, I mean, it was a fun fight, but it just, in my mind, wasn't really a competitive one. Unless Masvidal really slipped up and, and allowed Nate to just start to wear him down. But he's going to look at Connor the same. He's going to look at Connor like, okay, this guy's got a finite gas tank. I know that once he's thrown that left-hand rocket a few times that he's going to start to drop off. And he'll start to, and he'll just play that relaxed game like he did against Nate, where he's like cruising at 70%. Um, mm. I think it's a fascinating fight. But we, we, I mean, that's a step up for McGregor. That's a real test. Like Masvidal is an old veteran with a lot of, a lot of tricks in his game and a lot of ways to manipulate his opponent. And, uh, and it, he would be very, very difficult for McGregor to get inside his head. Nick, be honest, from a fan's point of view, this is the one that you want to see the most, isn't it? This is the biggest <laughs> fight you can make in the UFC right now. This makes so much sense on every single level. It would be the. I think it would generate more cash than we've ever seen, especially during this time when we're we're locked into pay per view numbers and you know no fans in the arena and no other sport going on and everything else. It's absolutely the two for me, the two biggest stars in the sport that we're able to match up right now. It would do incredible things for the UFC for mixed martial arts. Everybody would be talking about it. Masvidal last year, 2019, Masvidal became a star. A superstar in MMA, but a global star. Conor McGregor helps him become a global superstar, just like Conor is. It's absolutely huge. It could be the first of many fights if Conor's able to hold his own. I'm like, Dan, I think it's a hugely difficult fight for Conor. But you know what? Conor's all about legacy. Conor's all about leaving a legacy as one of the greatest mixed martial artists. That's what he keeps coming back to. Not the guy Mm. who's made more money and changed the game and all the things he's done and are locked in now. No one can take that away from him. He is adamant he wants to be considered one of the greatest of all time. Well, guess what? Stepping up to welterweight and beating Jorge Masvidal would put him in the bracket of one of the greatest of all time. For me, it'd be a bigger win than beating Kamara Usman for the world title belt, just because Masvidal's a bigger star and where the standing is in the sport, the respect that he's got from the fans all over the world, just where he is right now, it's the biggest fight to make. Is it a bit too big for Conor right now? Listen, I think if Conor had his three fights this year that he planned to have, then we potentially would have been talking about it early 2021 if Conor had the right wins at the right time and everything else. I think that's what they were building towards. A 2021 super fight between Conor, Masvidal for the BMF belt. But unfortunately, the world has changed. It looks like Masvidal, looking at his Instagram, his training pictures, you know, he's he's training with a lot of high-level wrestlers. It looks like the Kamara Usman fights are going to be announced at some stage during the lockdown period. So I don't know whether this fight is going to be available to Conor, but absolutely one day they've got to meet because the trash talk alone will be worth the uh, pay-per-view price. Absolutely. I don't want it to happen yet because I want to be there. I don't want to be in lockdown watching this on TV. (laughs) Right, boys, let's put our cojones on the line. Nick, I'll come to you first. In your heart of hearts, where do you think Connor's going to be going next? I'm going to ask you whether you think it'll be July, what weight it's going to be at and who the opponent will be. Listen, I, I think if he does come back, you know, it's going to have to be Fight Island. I'm guessing. Is he going to be able to get into the US? Are they allowing flights in, from, flights in from, from Ireland, from Dublin? I don't know. If it's Fight Island, I think it's a different opportunity. And I want to throw a couple of extra names in there quickly before Ooh. we sign off. Because if I'm an international fighter, I'm not based in the US, and I'm thinking, okay, Conor McGregor needs a dance partner for Fight Island. I'll tell you now, Dan Hooker should be blowing up his Instagram saying, come to Lightweight and take the spot off me because I'm next in line after Gaethje. And the other guy, and here's a curveball for you, Rocky Edwards should be on every <laughs> Instagram saying, I will go to Fight Island. I will put my welterweight number one spot on the line and I will face Conor McGregor at 170 pounds. That, my friend, is an opportunity for Rocky Edwards. So those two guys, hope they, hopefully they watch this. Hopefully they blow up their Instagram. But right here, right now, hand on heart, if it's going to happen, either in the US or or in the, on Fight Island, and it's going to be July, and it's going to be one of the six guys, as me and Dan alluded to then, I think the Diamond Dustin Poirier is at the front of the queue. Okay, Dan, to you then. Is there any other names that you want to throw in the hat before you make your pick? Well, I mean, that, that's a good one. Dan Hooker's a great one. I also think, you know, Charles Oliveira would be a fan, fantastic matchup, although at the moment there's not, not quite as much to gain. Um, 
I, I still think, you know, I mean, if I'm Conor McGregor, I'm pushing for a belt in between the two weight classes. I'm, I'm pushing for, a, for an inaugural fight against someone like Paul Felder or, I mean, even Kevin Lee would be a good option because we know he's too big for lightweight now. Um, you know, there are a few guys that are caught right between and I think Conor could just create his own belt. You know, there's no reason why Masvidal can't put the BMF title on the line and make that a 162 title shot. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I feel like there are so many opportunities to add that weight class in between and, and so many fighters that kind of fall in between those two weight classes. And Conor's, the, Conor and Masvidal are the two really that have the power to create that weight class. Um, and, I, and I think it needs doing, and I think it would, it would create a lot of interesting contenders. You know, I mean, Dan Hook is eventually going to have to go up. He's a, he's a big dude. Um, we've seen Charles Oliveira shift up a weight class and look really good. I wouldn't be surprised if he could put another seven pounds on and, and, and fight up again. James Vick's another one. You know, there are a lot of guys just kind of waiting in the wings for the opportunity. And, and I, I mean, honestly, I, I, I think... I think we're, it's going to be a while to, since uh, till we see Khabib fight again. I think the the health issues of his father is going to keep him out, and I mm -hmm. think uh, I think we're going to see Justin defending the interim title, and the only thing that makes sense is him is him defending that against Connor. Um, I, so I think that's the fight we're going to see. Uh, I think Connor at fifty five against Justin for the uh, for the interim title. Mm. Uh, that that'd be where my money's at. But I, like I said, I'd still like him like him to step on the scales at, at fifty five once before before he gets a title shot. Yep. Um, but I mean, you know, you can ask me, I'll keep banging on about the 162 belt for forever because it's it's a no brainer. It makes perfect sense. That's what That's I'd cool. actually like to see. But I think 55 title shot is uh, what's to come. There you go. Leave your comments in our uh, YouTube section. I'm sure you've got your own thought processes as to what you want to see Connor do next. We all want to see Justin against Habib for the lightweight title, but if that can't happen in July, then it makes perfect sense for Conor McGregor to step in and fight one of those two guys. Probably more likely to be Justin Gaethje. If it is lightweight, Dustin Poirier seems to be the guy that we're all edging towards, but if he wants to have a little bit of a dance at welterweight, it's the BMF and Masvidal and Fight Island. Tell you something. There's some sensational fights there for you, whatever angle it takes. We'll catch you next time. Mm -hmm.